Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let me give you a preview of what's coming up in this episode. On the season finale of the Movement Podcast, Gray and Lee sit down with local Virginian Charlie Hurt. Charlie is the opinion editor and columnist for the Washington Times and a Fox News contributor. We open with why Charlie sought out the guys for treatment and how being unaware of an everyday behavior was the cause of his pain. Gray explains how function, not structure, may be causing your movement problems and shares a story about being a young strength coach working with tennis athletes. The guys discuss how mentors need to be tough and how the level of grit in someone can predict their ability to stick to something no matter how difficult. They explore the need for failure to truly accomplish anything and the participation trophy culture. Gray talks physical currency and how many seek a fitness solution to a healthcare problem. We end today's show with some banter on growing up country and the independence of children and how it's changed. All of this and more on today's movement podcast, powered by FMS. So I'm really excited about having you on today, Charlie, with your background. And, and, you know, one, you've experienced a lot of what we try to get people to experience. Uh, unfortunately, you you experienced a lot of what our philosophy is because you had a problem. Yeah, um, but it, that's not unfortunately. That's well, awesome. Yeah. I, I learned so much from all that. Yeah. So can you just give us a little bit of kind of, if you don't mind, maybe kind of how you went yeah. through and, and your problem. I think you had a back problem, right? Actually, it was a couple of things. Uh, but the, the main thing was I guess what you would call sciatica. Uh, it was a you know a pain that shot down, kind of started in the lower back and then ended up going down all the way down to my leg and then to the point where it was the back of my heel. And for the longest time, I was like, oh, this is carpal tunnel because that's what, you know. And, it's because uh, what you saw on the uh, WebMD. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, WebMD, no, I, no, no, no. WebMD is always right. It, I, when I, my, my, my searching the internet for, because I don't go to the doctor. I, I I can't go to doctors. I can't stand going to doctors, um, which is what actually coming here and doing the thing with your torturer here <laughs> was, um, was is, it, it's a lot more like going onto the internet than it is going to a doctor because it's, it, it's, more, it's more about like, okay, quietly listening as opposed to just being told what's go, you know, what the problem is. And again, I was convinced that it was like something – having to do, because I, now I drive. I drive four hours up to D.C., four hours back, or I drive somewhere to get a plane to go to New York every week. And I, I had, when I moved to D.C. 20 years ago, I never drove anywhere. I, we bought a house on Capitol Hill because if I had to drive into D.C., I would have, like, killed, I would have murdered somebody <laughs> because of the traffic. And so, so I never, so I walked everywhere. Uh, I would walk to the White House, which was, you know, two, two miles away so that I would not have to encounter commuting. Um, and so, so that, so suddenly I went from zero travel a week to eight hours of sitting in a car in four hour, uh, segments. And I was convinced that it had to do with the, the pet, you know, extended foot pedal and all over time. And, and, and you all were very kind and were like, oh, okay, you think that's what that is. And we kept sort of working through it. Eventually, after the, it hit me the second time, and it was so debilitating, like I couldn't walk, I couldn't sit, and the and the last time I had it, I it was so bad, I literally could not lie down. There was like one position I could lie down with a little a, a little smiley face yellow emoji pillow that was my <laughs> daughter's. I could shove it on, on on the inside of my hip, uh, and like on my on, under my right pelvis, lying on my stomach, and I could sleep for maybe five minutes. And then I would wake with this shooting pain. And my wife would wake up and would be like, what the hell are you doing? I'd be leaning against the wall in the bedroom sleeping. That's how much pain it was. And, and I have a high tolerance of pain. And so, um, but, but what I eventually discovered is it was the way I was sitting in the car and I was sitting slumped to one side and I was pinching that side. And, you know, with my elbow, you know, my, my left hand hanging over the top of my steering wheel and my right elbow, you know, down here on the, on the, on the armrest. And it was just like destroying that little thing, but going through the exercises and going through the stretching 
and going through the, uh, you know, working on all the muscles that, that support, you know, we think of our ma major muscles, but all the little muscles that support all that, it, 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 it was on two levels. One is it fixed the problem. It made me learn uh, what the problem was so that I, and now I drive like an old lady, like, like <laughs> I, I did the, the wheel. And, and by, and by the way, this is, I, I, like, two. <laughs> ex oh, totally. 100%. I don't take them off. And, and there are little seams on the, the steering wheel. And I spend the entire time finding the seams and putting the same finger on the seam, on the seam on either side of the steering wheel. Um, but th this is after I've bought and sold two cars to, in order to, cause I thought, Oh, it must be the car. It was too small. It was too big or whatever it is. No, it's not that at all. It's the way you were sitting in the, in the thing. And, uh, but it was those, it, so, so it may, it makes you evaluate what the problem is. But then the other thing is what kind of what we were just talking about. It teaches you to sort of reevaluate like everything you do in life that affects your physical, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I remember the first time I came over here and you, you were talking about how do you stand? Right. Do you stand like on one, you know, with one leg cocked and the other straight or, you know, all those things. If it, it, Okay. You do it for five seconds standing there. That's one thing. If you do that five seconds, you know, every 30 seconds over the course of an entire day, you're screwed. Yeah. And, and you're becoming aware of those habits. And what you just said is invaluable in that in, in healthcare, we talk about structure and function, the way you're built in the way you use that. And it's really neat because so much in healthcare has become over-specialized. And so whatever part is bad, we can almost replace it or do surgery on it. So do you know how many people would have said, oh, Charlie, you got a disc, you yeah. got arthritis, get you the three epidurals. And when they don't work, get you your back surgery. And then you're going to go through a rehabilitation process and find out everything you can't do anymore. And we're going to give you those rules and limp on away. And so it's so easy to talk about structure and not function, but the one thing that hit me like a ton of bricks coming up as a young therapist and, and strength coach is male tennis players. There was a study that showed they had twice the bone density in their right arm as their left arm. Now, were they great tennis players because they were born with a rock-solid right yeah. arm, or did the act of gripping that racket and not letting it rotate on a topspin shot or something like that actually give them more muscular forces that actually made the bone rise to the occasion because the system won't exist out of balance. You get stronger, your bones get harder. You get weaker, your bones get softer. And so what you just articulated is my function was causing more of my problem than my structure because between me and you, you don't have sciatica and you didn't get surgery. Right. So we didn't alter you. You altered your behaviors and habits. And in doing that, your anatomy probably did change. We've got, there's a new book out called Breathe and it's about how over the last 500 years, our facial structure has changed because we don't chew hard food anymore. Oh, we're, wow. we're all eating baby food, right? But that's now changed our airway. We now have sleep apnea. We now have a lot more breathing and airway problems. But simply doing a few things actually can rechange your facial structure. So, so your skeleton can change your whole life if you'll let it. The only problem is our skeletons are changing the other way. We've, we're getting osteoporosis instead of, you know, standing tall and erect in our 70s. So, so just out of curiosity, uh, I, I like to eat off the fat of the land myself. W what is it we're supposed to be eating? What hard foods? Are we supposed to be eating like cracking walnuts? You're supposed to chew. Chew. And think about how many calories we can get without chewing. I heard one of the best pieces of dietary advice I ever heard is don't drink your calories. Now, if you like a little... Mm bourbon at night or you enjoy a beer, then let that be the thing. But then you don't need a smoothie for lunch, right? You, you don't need seven cups of bulletproof coffee. You think about how many calories we take in that we never chew. And then you'll start to realize that most of us are living on this big slurry of sugar yeah. and fat and salt that everybody knows we crave. And if we can get it quicker in a drive through oh, yeah. we will. Yeah. So that that's it. We, we just don't, we don't eat the roughage, the fiber. We don't we don't eat whole food or real right. food. We eat packaged convenience. Well, I think but, one thing you said in that when you're telling us, Charlie, your, your history of your, your issue with sciatica, that most people don't look at. People assume that the exercises, that things, the, the expert is going to fix them. Right. That's not going to happen. It's, right. it's basically becoming more self-aware and realizing that, hey, I'm doing certain things in my lifestyle that I've got to fix. 
so that the expert's not just going to, the expert's going to help you with that, but it's not going to fix you. You've got to take on that yourself. But that, and, and that's why, I, I, you know, the expert has to be there to challenge and ask the right questions and, you know, and in some cases torture you with, uh, you know, exercises and uh, needles and things like that. But, it, but it's amazing how, and, and this is the reason I don't ever go to doctors, is that, that it's, it's amazing how, how quickly so many people are to uh, make, tr try to make the problem go away in, in the cheapest, simplest way possible. By cheapest, I mean cheapest to the patient. Um, I remember having a, well, I guess it's a, a jaw thing, a TMJ type thing. And, you know, I went to a doctor and the first thing they're like, okay, here, um, and gave me like a whole raft of, of narcotics to take. And I'm like, look, man, I got enough problems and I know this, <laughs> that will become a problem. I don't need it. Right. And, um, and, but I mean, they literally would just stand in there, just write down all the prescriptions for me. And I'm like, dude. And then of course the second thing was surgery. And I'm like, okay, well that just means that, that after surgery, then I get all those drugs and then I got a problem. I, I don't need any of this. And I, and, and, and actually, um, I ended up, uh, determining that it was earplugs because I slept with earplugs because I lived in the city, ah. you know, right next to a big, you know, major Avenue. And so I would sleep with earplugs all the time and that, and, and the earplugs would sort of irritate that, that one. And just so everybody knows your TM joint is your jaw joint, which is literally a quarter inch from the front side of your ear canal. So anything you do in excess with your ear canal can actually throw off that joint, you know, just like shoes can throw off your, your alignment and, of, and of your course, body. Yeah. The, the only reason I arrived at that is because I had this wonderful, have this wonderful friend. She's a lunatic. <laughs> and she does, you know, she, she's all into homeopathic stuff. And, sure. I mean, just a total like nutcase. And I love her dearly. Um, and we, uh, play squash together. And so, uh, she was, she's always looking for sort of these homemade, uh, therapies and stuff like that. Sometimes it gets you into a little bit of trouble. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it goes back to exactly what you guys do, which is where you, you try to, you just try to go down the rabbit hole of, okay, what's the problem here? And you get to the bottom of it. And, and it was, and she was the one who was, who was like, so how, you know, how do you sleep? How do you do? And, and when we got arrived at that, I didn't even know what you just said about the joint T whatever. Um, but when I took it out and it didn't happen like that. Right. It, that's the other thing. That's it, a bad thing in this culture. Cause we expect yeah. it as quick as Google yeah. can give us an answer, but that's right. not the solution. Right. That's the potential solution. You right. haven't exercised it yet. Right. <laughs> and it, and it took, and it took weeks, but once, once that, that pain and talk about pain, the only pain, the only pain I've ever had that was worse than the freaking sciatica was that TMJ pain. It was that withering pain where you where like things shimmy in front of you, like, like hot, the heat off the pavement where you're just like standing there and it's like, Whoo! And, and of course, uh, I like to point out my high tolerance of pain uh, <laughs> as frequently as I can. And then my wife likes to point out that, oh yeah, well, uh, twice while I was pregnant with one of your kids, um, I also had sciatica, so I really don't want to hear about it. <laughs> well, let me um, ask this question. Your background, so just so everyone knows, as a, as a journalist, right? Right. Um, I hate that word. I work for newspaper. I was a newspaper. You, you tell, yeah. What, how, would a, we, how would we refer I, to I you? Was in, I was a newspaper reporter. It's all I ever wanted to do. Starting out, you know, when I was a little kid in Chatham, I just, and part of it is just, you know, an ADD kid who wants to see house fires and dead bodies. And <laughs> it's just pretty exciting. And then you get paid for it. You go, you know, you go home and you write a story about it. And, uh, and you get to go after people. You get to go after jerks in power who are screwing over people. I mean, it's, and then you get to expose them and they yell at you and, you know, you get to Robin Hood. Yeah. You get to, to, uh, well, he was a criminal, so, <laughs> but I, I'm, I wasn't that, but, uh, no, but it's great. And, uh, no, but it's just so funny. Cause the, of course the shorthand term for it is journalist, but I always think of, you know, I always think of journalists as being so many of the people who are in the business today who, who it's like, they're keeping a journal for themselves. And it's like, dude, you're in this for the wrong business, man. Go, go be a, well, I don't want to say. I like that. I, you know what? That's funny. You say that, and, and it resonates with me. With that, is 
they keep in a journal for themselves because that's what's getting yeah. – and you're inserting – reporters are inserting too much of their own opinion into what should be just reporting the information. Because it sounds like to me you were interested in investigation, getting to the yeah. heart of the matter, and then articulating that in a way that other people could appreciate it at yeah. a glance and not at your investment. Well, that's that, mm -hmm. that was what I, the reason I brought it up, Charlie, is because the problem that we see in our – profession is trying to get people to um, kind of go through the process you went through. And I'm just wondering if your background had had anything to do with it. And what I mean by that is you wanted to find out or you were very intrigued to understand what's causing my problem. Right. I've got TMJ. I don't want to go take drugs. I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I, right. I, you know, can I find out what's going on here? And sometimes that's hard for us to explain Somebody's coming in to see Gray or me or whoever with back pain. Hey, fix my back. Right. Well, in order for me to fix your back, we got to figure out what's causing that pain. And that's hard for sometimes to, to figure out. Right. Well, I mean, one of the, the blessings and curses of being a reporter and always wanting to be a reporter is that you either think you know everything or you think you can figure everything out. And, you know, a, a good reporter has a knowledge base that is miles wide and like a centimeter deep. They don't, you know, and, and unless it's this, an area that they really happen to, to be working on. And then they know a whole lot about that one thing. And you don't ever want to get hung up with a good reporter who knows what they're talking about that one thing, because they come at it as generalists, which is a very good thing. Um, and, uh, and, and th the problem of course comes when these people forget that they are generalists and they think they're experts and and quite frankly journalism school for example is one of these things that that teaches these kids that that somehow this is a profession no it's not a profession if you want to be the best reporters i ever the best editors i ever worked for were people who maybe never finished high school uh certainly didn't finish college and they could have cared less they're the smartest people you ever met because they ask questions uh, they got pissed off when people lied to them and they uh, were able to sort of figure things, you know, you figure things out. You're speaking about an editor like a mentor and, yeah. and, and a, a sounding board or reflection. Basically you, th I, I, I have tried writing. I hate writing. I'd rather just talk about it, but books sell and, and stuff like that. But the editing process of my thoughts, um, is a very hard thing to take, but it creates huge maturity in, in the way you think. So that, that's awesome that, that an editor almost in your situation is doing what a coach or a dissertation professor would do is really making you explore every corner of your thought. You oh, know? I mean, if uh, an editor that doesn't, uh, you know, scream at you, throw your notebook back at you <laughs> and make you go back. I mean, like the first thing I learned as a reporter was to, Write that, you know, I mean, I would enter, you know, and I was, you know, 20 years old and I was in Detroit and I had no idea, you know, but, and I would just say to the person, you know, I'd be, you know, there'd be some murder or car accident or house fire or something like that. And I'd be like, look, I'm really sorry, but my, my editor is going to kill me. I'm going to literally lose my job tonight if I get, cause I'm going to get something wrong here. I got to get your number and you got to let me call you back. When we when I get back to the newsroom because I I'm, I'm sure I got something wrong. I mean the the amount of times you have to do things eight times before you get it exactly right. And I don't and 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 I don't. That's so important because anytime you're forced to do things over and over and over and over again, and you get sent back to the rock pile until you get it exactly right, that's benefits you no matter. I, I don't care what you're doing. That, that's a thing that is emerging in pro sports. Major League Baseball was looking at a lot of the stats that Lee and I have had something to do with, with the functional movement, stuff like that. But that whole thing that uh, I, I think it's Angela Duckworth, the, the whole study on grit, grittiness, yeah. all right? It's a, something that you can actually measure in a questionnaire is how long will you stick with that which engages you? Right. And that's what they say is one of the determining factors. A lot of guys can get into the pros. The Hall of Fame, that's a very small percentage. And it's not athleticism or intellect or anything. It's that grit. It's basically willing to basically have that notebook thrown back at you six right. times and still feel the challenge, not the humility uh, alone. That's, uh, and that's something that I, I, I often wonder, 
how do you foster that? Because I, I look at myself with, with a group of guys like Lee and some of our colleagues looking at all the times when I probably wasn't that, that good leader, that good editor, that, you know, trying to push my agenda instead of really saying, all right, let's figure this thing out. But the longer I stay in it, the more I realize some questions you don't have to answer this minute, uh, but you still need to ask those questions. Well, They've the, got to be answered. The interesting thing, I think, when you bring up the grit, that's the backbone of everything, those people. It's not the elite. The elite right. need those other people. You look at LeBron James or Peyton Manning or Tom Brady, they were born that way. They've got that. It's in, in whatever situation you're in, it's those middle-of-the-road people, the ones that are gritty, the ones that stick it out, the guys that are playing these pro sports, the average NFL guys are only going to be around three years, the guy that's around five years, six years, ten years, that you never hear about. Those are the ones that have the grit that really yeah. – and, and that, I think that's something we have to start looking at and tapping into in any situation. We've heard that two years of talent and a 10 year career. That's grit. <laughs> that's yeah. a good, that's somebody who's becoming self-aware by the minute and self-managing by the minute. So. Yeah. And, and, and to me, and one of the reasons that, you know, my family and I moved back here to Chatham from DC is that there, there's so many, you know, being out outdoors and for, especially for kids, especially for a boy growing up, um, having those, titanic challenges, whether it's hunting or fishing or whatever sort of pursuits there are, usually it involves being outdoors. Usually it involves ha being outside in, a, in an environment where you're on your own. Um, having that and uh, having those incredible obstacles that you have to figure out a way around and put not minutes or hours, but sometimes days and weeks and months into of failure and failure and failure and failure until you have success. Um, I think that's where that grit comes from. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and obviously I think, I think girls are a little bit different because girls tend to um, uh, just be intellectually superior and they're able to sort of um, intellectualize problems and solve them in, a, in, a, in their minds in a way that a lot more intelligently than I think boys do. Boys have to have that failure. That, they have to feel that failure for a long time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. You, you take two boys, one who's a success at everything and never has an obstacle in the, in his, because he's so smart. And then one who has every imaginable problem. Everything is, a, is, is difficult to him. I look at that second one and I go, that kid is going to cure cancer. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, and, and, and I'm not sure a participation trophy just for oh. showing up is going to get that for you. I mean, the, it destroys them. Competition yeah. is good, and, and, and we've, we've mapped it out. You need the competition, but what we know that happens in a child's growth spurt is you can have a child that's very, very successful before they hit that puberty, that growth spurt. And parents get pulled into district and region and statewide competition. All of a sudden, the kid gets awkward and confused in the exact same year because hormones are, are right. released. Oh, yeah. They will become less athletic, sort of gangly and uncoordinated, all because of the mechanical part of growing. There's a huge amount of psychology that's happening there. Yeah. And some kids never recover and reinvent their physical self. And your intellectual self, your emotional self, your physical self, they got to sort of line up. Yeah. And, and, and so a lot of kids have a bad experience because of that need of over-specialization. A kid shows a little bit of interest in baseball, and before you know it, he's playing three seasons of it a year. And, yeah. and that's not necessary, but it's also not necessary – to make you feel you've accomplished something when all you did is show up for every practice and game. That's the first yeah. participation starts with presence, but there's a little bit more. Well, than I that. think, I think, you know, you start, you gravitate to something you're good at and then you want to keep doing what you're good at. And I think part of that, again, that goes back to parents, especially with kids. And one of the, the quotes that, that I love from Phil Knight. Now, again, I don't know whether he said it or whether he got it from somebody else is fail. If you're going to fail, fail fast. Yeah. And I love that quote and apply to, I mean, you need to fail. Yeah. And I think parents want to put them in these sports and let them play the same sport the year round because they're good. And they're so worried that they're going to fail, yeah. but they need to fail. Well, you, take that, fail you take that one principle to Silicon Valley and look what all of the companies done. Add one word to it. Fail fast with feedback. Right. Meaning it's not just failure. 
And and we're going to remove all emotion, and we're going to put this in a numerical thing. Right. You got to be above this, and you'll figure out how to get there. And if you want a little bit, and that's that's all it is. It's yeah. just show me show me that gauge, show me that thermometer, and let's take this out of a narrative real quick. You either got the football through the tire or you didn't. Right. And that's that's deliberate practice. It's not practice. Right. They talk about that in the talent code. It's deliberate practice. You've got to expose yourself to feedback. It won't all be positive. Fe- uh, fear of failure is like the greatest motivator on earth. And the idea that we want to remove that is just insane. I mean, every time somebody gives that hands out a kid a participa- participation trophy, they should ask themselves, how much longer would it have taken for that kid to have succeeded because when you when when you say no you haven't succeeded yet that that sends them back to 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 trying their their best and the only way it's going the only way they're going to hit success is by succeeding yeah. it's not going to be by saying okay we're going to change the rules and say you succeeded when you didn't actually Growth and discomfort go hand in hand. And yeah. so if you're, are you uncomfortable? Yeah, then you're probably growing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always growing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm always screwing it up. And I, and I, by the way, I'm a very fast failer. I'm, I'm, I fail very quickly. Yeah. Well, I think ADD I'm the same is built boat. for that. Yeah. <laughs> what? ADD is built for that, right? I mean, <laughs> you're going to you're gonna do a lot of stuff. You're going to sample everything. You're going to get hurt so a little. So every teacher that I ever had growing up, uh, it tried to put me on drugs. Um, and my mother just was like, nope, nope. And she didn't know, I, she, you know, she didn't care. She's like, no, you're not. I, I think part of it, my mother probably thought her children were perfect, which was, <laughs> um, but, uh, but the, the, that whole thing, are you kidding me? Are you, I, I mean, I, I get it. I, 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 I hate to browbeat people for doing what they think is best, but I mean, th- the idea that ADD is something that, that is addressed any other way than you got to figure it out. Um, and I, I'm sure there are extreme cases where, you know, it has to be um, dealt with medically. But my mm-hmm. dad's solution for it is, well, if you're a little more tired, you'll probably sit still. That's true. So he, he knew how to do that. That's true. <laughs> he knew how to get me tired. That, 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 <laughs> that, that, every time I screwed up, the, I always knew because I would get, you know, get that tug on the toe at, you know, five o'clock the next morning and yep, we're going to go, we're going to go do some work. Yeah. We're going to go chop up that tree. We're going to go cut some grass. You can go to bed anytime you want, but we're getting up at five. Yep. It doesn't take long to, fi- that's what and, the military does. Yep. You can go to bed anytime you want, but and we're you, all getting up at five. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you, you know, you, you can walk or, you know, you can walk out uh, around the stump and throw up and, but you got to come back and get right back to work. Don't want to hear. There's. There's something I want to throw at you, and it's it's not on anything okay. that we've prepared for. <laughs> I'm I'm impressed. You said prepared. When, when did you do there's that? There's no reason to prepare. Good, good reflex action is all we need here. I've philosophically speaking, I've been going through the 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 problem we currently have in in our physical culture with with healthcare, fitness, and and more children being obese now than ever before. And every time we screw up. We don't face the music. We used to call type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes until we gave it to kids. And then we started calling it type 2, meaning a poor lifestyle yeah. gets you to adult onset diabetes. It's, it's not something that's hereditary. But if you eat, sleep, and live like your parents, then yes, it is hereditary. But by the socialization of we can live this way, not genetically. So it's, it's very easy to make those things convenient. So we're we're positioning ourselves to help healthcare do a better accounting of what we need to do and we look at that through risk factors but in musculoskeletal medicine the aches and pains that the the two that you had that caused you the most pain in your life both fit under musculoskeletal 80% of the things that keep you from doing what you want to do today will be musculoskeletal because it's such a big organ system it's not yeah. a kidney it's bones joints neurological system so if I've got to explain what has happened, I almost want to use the term physical currency because we all know how to manage money real quick. It's, it's a lesson we, can, we all need to learn in life. And if we go all the way back to Aristotle's definition of currency, he said it's got to be durable, portable, divisible, and have intrinsic value. 
And I was explaining to Lee and, and Andy and even my brother, Matt, we're going over this for about the last six months. You walk into a room as a teenage boy, you quickly know who you want to take to a fight mm-hmm. <laughs> and who you don't want to take to a fight. Meaning we are always judging each other physically. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I walk into a room and I know if something goes wrong here, these are the people I'm going to need to help. And these are the people that can help me. And I think we all project a physical currency. Uh, If you've ever been a baseball pitcher, a batter stands up, he doesn't do anything yet. And you know, you have a formidable opponent. He has a physical currency about him. And we cash that in with our actions. And if I had to explain your physical assets and liabilities, I can easily do that now with layers of evaluation. We can look at your health status. We can look at your movement status. We can look at your fitness status. And then we can say, are you meeting all the physical goals you want? And easily, just like a financial advisor, tell you where you're leaking money and where Mm. you're making money. And so many people right now Google fitness for a healthcare problem. And that's the, that's the problem in a nutshell. But I honestly think we could empower more people to talk about this physical life if we treated your physical attributes like currency and, and looked at those definitions. We, we, we size up somebody else's physicality without even knowing it. It is a reflexive thing because I need to know if you're friend or foe, and I need to know if I need to help you or you can help me. And, and these are, these are things where I think I always look for easier ways to explain it because you shouldn't have to learn your back anatomy to get rid of your sciatica. And I shouldn't tell you how to get well by telling you the way I learned how to fix your back. I need to, I need to allow you to become self-aware the lesson will last longer than if I just give you the script of here's not, here's how not to hurt your back. So as a, as a journalist, I would love to reporter. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> investigator. I would love to dissect every opinion we have about this physical life, but by the definition of currency, how much of this, you know, crocodile Dundee comes to the U S he does fine in New York city. He's only been prepared in the outback, but he has physical currency. He'll figure it out. <laughs> Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll hear more from the guys and Charlie. FMS is your baseline. The functional movement screen is an objective tool that measures seven fundamental movements that are key to daily life and determines if those movement patterns are optimal, acceptable, or dysfunctional. While the screen is simple and efficient to perform, each test has been strategically selected due to the significant feedback it provides on mobility, stability, and how both work together for larger integrated functional movements. Based on the screen results, FMS professionals can then prioritize exercise and programming to accommodate their clients' needs so they can achieve higher levels of fitness and performance. This highly customized exercise selection protects clients from factors that inhibit progress and produces self-aware clients and athletes who can now reach greater heights in lifelong movement health and vitality. Whether your focus is optimizing training, maximizing client retention, or enhancing communication, the screen helps you get there. It is the foundation for one of our basic beliefs. Play to your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Explore our course options and get started today. Well, it's kind of interesting. And this goes back to the discussion about uh, reporter versus journalist. It also has, the break also sort of has to do with urban versus rural. Okay. Um, you know, Jeffersonian democracy envisions that you would always have this sort of rural, huge, massive agricultural rural element to a country and that a country can't survive without that. Um, the biggest thing that I noticed about living in a city for so long after having grown up in the country is the lack of physicality. It just doesn't exist. Everything is within a, you know, on a stairmaster or something like that. The real courageous people will go out um, and go to a gym and they'll sit in front of a plate glass window and pedal. And I'm not knocking it. I, 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 it breaks my heart to think of, of the years that I try, <laughs> I tried to survive like that. And it's, it's, it's a real breakdown. And so I wonder how much of that that you're talking about actually even goes on in a, in a city. And, and, and to bring it back to the whole thing about journalist versus reporter, you know, the, the number of people who wind up in the business of covering stuff in newspapers who didn't have some other job 
didn't work construction, didn't pull tobacco, didn't do all, so, something else that made them learn all of the the different um, things that 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 other people have to learn and figure out and, and in order to achieve success in other areas. If that's your only register for success your entire life, man, what a sheltered, pathetic, sad life that is. Um, and, and, and I don't know exactly what the answer to it is. Well, the one thing I said is, uh, I think of the word transferable. If you invest yourself in some exercise, you want to get more flexible. You want to learn to meditate. So you can do some yoga and breathe. You want to self-defense martial arts. We all invest ourselves physically in something. Woodworking is a physical endeavor. So we invest ourselves in something physical. And what we often find out is a noble physical endeavor is transferable to many other activities. You learn to split wood, then you also learn that a little time sharpening that ax makes everything, mm. right? Abraham yeah. Lincoln. So, so many of the things that happened in that window on that Stairmaster aren't transferable to anything else. Yeah. The, the guy in the gym still can't split enough wood to keep his house warm. Well, that's, that's therein lies the problem, yeah. is, is kind of what Charles was saying, is the urban areas, that's their only... That's what you think you have to do. I mean, right. the the individuals who we all know we need to exercise. <laughs> That's not, I mean, everybody right. in the world knows exercise should be part. But I think the assumption is that it's you've got to go get on the stairmaster. Right. No, you don't. You just have to be active. You just right. have to do something outside. You know, get outside, be active. Don't sit in a cubicle all day and then go into a stairmaster for twenty minutes. That's not going to work. Yeah. So, so I was uh, looking into getting one of these sides for cutting fields and there's all sorts of, you know, all right, explain that. Cause I guarantee you most people aren't going to know what that is. So, so yeah. So, you know, the side that they're, they're, they're these, they're sides with, you know, with a long, you know, th two, two and a half foot blade at the end of it. And you, you get them and you can cut, you cut fields with them and you can do it like an, an acre in in, you know, an hour or so. Um, and, but it's a lot of work and there are talk about gut bacteria, you know, healthy gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, uh, sort of there, there's a lot of, um, information out there that suggests that this is actually really good for the soil because of the way this stuff breaks down. And then, but the real thing that I find appealing about all of it is that it's, uh, it's physical manual labor and having to, uh, cut hay and then. Uh, gather hay, rake hay mm -hmm. by hand, yeah. especially when you have children uh, and you're trying to to squeeze every drip of energy out of them every <laughs> single day. I was going through. I found a box of um, of all things that I hadn't opened since we moved back to here, and uh, it, it was a box of work gloves. And there were all these little kids' work gloves that I had, where, where they had like w like worn through the fingers and the, and the palms, and it just it brought a tear to my eyes. Thinking, oh man, those are we worked their little hands to death. It was so great. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, so I was I was uh, looking into this, and this guy was talking about doing the field, cutting his field with the yep. side, and uh, and he gets kind of crazy looks, and these people are jogging down the street you know, in his rural area and looks over and they're like, this idiot cutting his field. And the guy's like, this, these idiots, look at them. They're running for no reason. What, what do you need a lift? I got a car right here. I can pick you up, drive you where you need to go. Yeah. Or I could sit here and do the exact same thing, work my entire body and uh, come up with this really awesomely cut field that I did by my hand. But, but people, no one, I always want to stop and pick people up that I see running down the road. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you? Is They're something, chasing you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Hey, get in. I, this is a safe space. Get in. I'll take you wherever you need to go. You'll get there in no time. I got plenty of time, no problem. But but somehow we're the idiots. And it's like, and again, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a runner. I, 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 I can't run. I, it's just not. Well, in, but, in, in, in this county, in Southern Virginia, you see a grown man walking, riding a bike or a moped. You assume he's got a DUI. And <laughs> he just doesn't have a driver's license. This is not a fitness decision. This is this is a practical decision because my this, license was taken away. This is true. He just didn't have the right lawyer. That's the problem. That's right. Yeah. No, you, you, you bring up a point where my, my dad was voted the most outstanding athlete in the city of Richmond when he graduated high school, and I don't think he ever lifted a weight in his life. But yet, by the time I got to Chatham High School, 
the weight room, it was inconceivable that you would play football and not go to the weight room. But we still pulled the back in the morning right. before we went to the weight room in the afternoon and practiced football after the, the sun wasn't so hot in the afternoon. But it was almost like implied that you can't do this without the weight room. But, but so many generations before us never needed that. And I'm not saying the weight room is bad. I'm just saying if you're going to get off the field to go in a room so you can be better on the field, then measure every rep and every set. And if it's not transferable, then it's entertainment right. and for show. Uh, the, 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 the old term we used to get when Lee and I first started working in the NFL is there was a term that was said amount, around the admin guys and the coaches, looks like Tarzan plays like Jane, which means way more time in the weight room than on the gridiron. Right. Yeah. And it but, could apply to any sport, but, but you can't, you can't get all that physical equity that guys with leather football helmets, less concussions with leather helmets. What is, is that, that true? Tell? Yeah. Is that really true? Well, I just don't think we, everybody got concussions. We just didn't care that yeah, much. I was going to say, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, diagnosed. Do you know how smart I would be today if I hadn't had all the concussions that's that right. I had? I mean, I, that, and, the, and that's my excuse. Like whenever, uh, you know, my kids find, the, the problem with moving back to the town you grew up in is then your kids start hearing stories. And, yep. you're, and and I'm a firm believer in always lying to your children. There are <laughs> several things. You if always, they're smart, they'll yeah. figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, no, and, and if they're a girl, my daughter, I, I'm totally honest with her. It's like, ah, whatever. You, you, you don't want to be like me, right? And she's like, no. <laughs> the boys are like, oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's go hit our head. <laughs> they think that that's. But it's amazing the number of concussions that I, and I didn't know what they were at the time. I just thought that you just sort of, would have some horrific bike accident and then like three minutes later you would be somewhere else and you just had to act cool and act like you're not you and not say how did i get here what's going on who who are you you can't you know you you have to just sort of you know girls it. girls soccer right now has a huge amount of concussions and i honestly think it's it's simple and easy and physical to explain they don't need to start wearing helmets but if we're going to teach somebody how to run fast we got to teach them how to stop hard Oh, and and yeah. we don't, we, we so when we start strength conditioning, we pick the attributes we think are success and we don't fully rebalance the car. If you add 30 horsepower to my car, you better give me a better set of brakes because right. I'm going to drive faster. So, so, so the, the, the difference is people with leather helmets knew how to not hit their heads and they it's didn't not, use it as a weapon. It's not right, a weapon. Right, exactly. Right. Well, again, keep, you're self-aware. You know, you're not yeah, going to go dive self-aware. into a big, you go. a big pile of people with nothing protecting your yeah. head. Right. Versus today, you get this big, nice helmet on, you'll do it. No, you, you give a good athlete, you give a good athlete one extra tool, they'll learn to use it. But it was never intended. It was in- right. intended for safety, not an offensive attribute. But but that's what happens. And so we've got a lot of people who are playing outside of their skill set. They're having collisions they shouldn't otherwise have. Right. They're running into things. But it's simply because we've trained one physical attribute and didn't rebalance it. So it's a, 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 like with horses. I'm, I tell the kids, don't, you know, you can wear a hat, don't wear a helmet, but, uh, if you get thrown, you know, watch your head. You're going to be a lot, you're going to be more conservative because you know, exactly. you you put bubble wrap all over, put all this equipment on, I'm going to go do whatever. Yeah, no. And like with the four wheelers, my rule with, you don't have to wear a helmet with four wheeler, but if you're on the four wheeler and I see you doing something where you need a helmet, I'm going to take the four wheeler. I'm going to take it to the Goodwill and I'm going to give it to the Goodwill and tell them to sell it for like for four dollars to the first <laughs> so kid. Really hurt. <laughs> the first kid it really hurt. And hopefully it'll be a neighbor so they get to <laughs> listen to it all the time. And you know, I mean, who knows what happens? I know what I well, I won't, uh, we won't go there. You self regulate. Did, did you ride dirt bikes when when you guys were growing up or go karts or what was your? We, uh, we did dirt bike. Uh, we did dirt bikes, but not. Uh, but we didn't, my, my parents were smart. <laughs> you know, that old Willie's Jeep, the 1942 Willie's Jeep yeah. that belonged to my grand, my grandfather bought it after the war surplus. Um, and mysteriously, like the moment my brother turned 16, the Jeep broke down <laughs> <laughs> and dad took it to like every mechanic unknown to man and nobody could fix it. And then the second my sister, who's the youngest, turned 16, <laughs> found somebody who could fix it. <laughs> and he gave it to her and let her drive it with the stip- stipulation that if we, he ever caught her loaning it to us, he was going to take it away from her. And to this day, she, she owns the thing. 
And, <laughs> and I'm, I look back at it and I'm like, dad, what are you thinking, man? This is like, the, we could, do you know how much better our youth would have been if we'd had that thing? And he's like, yeah, cause I was six, when I was 16, I had it. And yeah. the number of times he turned that thing over. And I'm like, uh, you know, we would be so much better at turning things over now if we had just had that experience. Well, to give you one, uh, I grew up across the way from Hank Maxey and, and we, we worked on a farm that together. Was trouble. It was trouble, but I had the dirt bike. And when he went to his dad and said, I want a dirt bike too, Henry Maxey and his wisdom said, uh, no, I'm going to get you something you can use. And there were no gators at the time. And there really weren't four wheelers at the time. There were right. three wheelers. The three just wheelers. Yeah, you don't want, you want any Ooh. part of that. A Datsun truck that probably had one cylinder that didn't work. And this is before Nissan or whatever. Four-speed, two-wheel drive Datsun truck with bald tires, and he could haul stuff around. Well, my dad had a Ford Falcon with farm use tags on it, so he couldn't have a dirt bike, so we couldn't play dirt bike together, and Dukes of Hazard was on TV at the time. <laughs> so he, we would go down tobacco rows that had been topped out, and I was chasing the Datsun truck, and uh, we did turn a vehicle over, but we also had the equipment to turn it back over and bring it back home. And, <laughs> and, and, you, and you knew the only thing, the only thing you had to make sure didn't happen is dad find out. Well, I don't know if my dad found out right away, but uh, Henry Maxey let slip one day. We were down at the barn working. He's like, uh, a lot of tire tracks over there in that pasture. <laughs> it's just like, I'm watching. I'm like, okay, well, okay, we got one across the bow. <laughs> but it's the independence that I think he grew up with on dirt bikes, we had about a 25, 30 mile radius between the pipelines and stuff. On a yeah. Sunday afternoon, I could get halfway to Danville and never be on the hard surface too much. <laughs> a yeah, little exactly. bit. But yeah, we just had that independence and, and, it got a lot of the wiggles out that I think a lot of, to, to your point, that a lot of people are trying to medicate or legislate out. It's like kids going to wiggle. Just well, what, make sure they have a path to wiggle on. Right. Where, where did that independence go off, off track? I mean, where, where, where and again, just having that discussion. Because well, right now, I mean, you know, kids can't even go in the cul-de-sac and play without their parents. I mean, without even the police showing up and say, where are your parents? Well, so, so the other thing is this thing, you know, I, I, the cell phone. That, you know, and, you know, I reluctantly, I, I, I hate the idea of it, but at some point, and I guess it started when we were still living in the city and my daughter was going, taking herself across town to go to school and you're like, okay, well, so you need a phone. And then little by little, you just sort of surrender and you give them phones for your own. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the only thing I yell at my kids about is if you respond to a text from me too quickly, I'm going to just raise hell with you. Because that means you're sitting there looking at this stupid thing all the time. You, you better, if I send you a text, like, where the hell are you? I better not hear from you for at least 15 minutes. I've, I now realize the kids have, like, figured out that, oh, they see it immediately. They're like, oh, yeah, just respond to that in 15 minutes. It'll be okay. <laughs> um, but seriously, though, the, 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 um, the amount of jackpots that this phone gets a kid out of I mean, jackpots where you're genuinely scared about what the trouble you got into, whether, I mean, I think about, you know, we would ride down rivers, uh, you know, where, and I guess you can go places now where you don't get cell signals, but it's probably not uh, that, that common. If you fell out of your, the canoe, again, going back to, you were careful not mm -hmm. to, because you knew, okay, you fell out, you split your head open. And what are we going to do? We're going to load you back in the canoe and it's going to be five and a half hours before we get to the bottom. Well, it's, it's just like your analogy with, with riding the four wheeler with no helmet. Right. It's the same, same situation is right. that kids, kids have that comfort. Right. Kids, kids and, and our culture has gotten to be that comfortable with knowing I'm, I'm one, I'm one click away from getting the answer I want. Right. In, in a lot right. of different scenarios. And, well, but, but it's also the, but the, once you screw something up, that fear of having to figure it out is, I mean, that, 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 learning to get out of jackpots is like, that's like the only thing I've ever, that's ever been of any, the only thing I ever learned as a kid that has ever been of any real use to me is those moments where, you know, you, you wind up putting something in the top of a tree and you're like, oh crap, we got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And you figure it out, you yeah. know? And, and well, that, that phone creates that, 
that symbolic currency, but as soon yeah. as the cell signal's yeah. dead, you got to be on your own. I, I had uh, a bunch of kids on the James River yesterday, and the whole time we had no cell signal or anything, and there was a big rock, and everybody wanted to jump off that rock into the river. So they said, do you think we should jump off? And I'm like, how would you figure out the answer if I wasn't here? So we paddled over, and they swam in, and I said, get like a pencil and just go down as deep as you can. Did you hit bottom? No. Well, then there's no way that anything is you can jump off right. the rock. But you got to prove to me that it's safe. I'm not going to tell you if it's safe or not, right. and we can't Google it right now. Right. And and it was it was awesome. It was it was the best hour I spent yesterday. And if I were just using it entertainment, I would have checked it out, paddled them over there, let them jump off the rock, take the selfie, and then jump back on the boat. No, we turned it into a hour and a half process of should we jump off the rock? Is it is it physically safe? And it was it was absolutely awesome. And and it was just cool. You I'm, know? I'm sorry, Lee. Did you get the invitation for this float? Because I, I, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't no. get an invitation for this float. No, but I mean, I'm around him too much anyway. <laughs> there was no beer on the float. I, I I was being Gray Cook PE teacher yesterday. So it was a uh, nieces I, and nephews. I would that, sign up for that class. All right. Yeah. You kidding me? It would have been okay. But like we, I said, I'd, I'd deal with him too much as it is. <laughs> You, so, you, you, so I'm like, all right. You, 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 you would go and test and find out the water was one foot deep and say, yeah, great, it's great, fine. Go, go right ahead. Jump. ahead. It's fine. It's, <laughs> land no, right here. No problem. <laughs> Lee would have just picked the kid he didn't like the most. You jump first. Well, yeah, you go ahead and go off. I, I'll, I'll come right after you. <laughs> We're going to have a teaching moment either way. <laughs> this, is my, this is the teaching moment of survival of the fittest. <laughs> if you survive, then we'll go. Well, you know, you know, you know what it is. We, I think we've been around three times, and the one thing we're saying is natural consequences can be hugely instructive, and if they're scaled correctly, you can actually get a lesson without too bad an injury. But it's it's going to hurt a little bit, or it's gonna it's going to be shocking a little bit. But that's okay. That's those are you know the one of one of the quotes I keep applying to myself. The my whole life is a fool who persists in his folly will soon become wise. Yeah. Just just just. Take that thought that you think is right and keep pressing it in every situation, um, but but be enthusiastic about it. Take that as far as you can go, and it'll either instruct you or you'll find out you're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and certainly, I mean, you know, the, and it goes back to the whole thing about failure. I mean, failure, f- failure, and fear of failure. It's not bad. It's, it, yeah. it, well, here's it, Lee and I are responsible for creating a lot of tests that we never thought will become internationally known. We. We never had a political campaign to get our stuff in the military or in the NFL or NHL or, or pro sports, and yet we created a test. What we weren't prepared for was the emotional response when people fail the test. And I'm like, wait a second. A test is simply a prediction of how you're going to fare in the next environment, mm. right? So if you're taking eighth grade math and fail it, you're probably not going to do good in ninth grade math. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Right? right? So a test fail is actually protecting you from a life loss, time, money, whatever. So when we test each other, which is part of the educational process, you can learn from previous generations. If we simply test you and you believe the test is valid and authentic, then behave differently or prepare for loss. And People who don't get too much ego tied up in a test score realize it's simply a gauge on the dashboard, empty, full, too fast, too slow. So if you have an emotional response to failure, you're missing the point of failure. It's literally a a polite warning that life is going to take something from you if you don't take a lesson from the failure. But too often, the test Uh, We practice the test. We study for the SAT. The SAT ceases to be a prediction of your first year in college the minute you start getting coached to do the thing. To take the test. Right, right. Just let it be what it is, man. And and let, you know, when, do you, do you study up? I mean, you don't go to doctors, but if you had to go for a physical for a new insurance policy, would you study up for it? Or would you just say, hey, I wonder what things are like compared to everybody else my age? And it's a, it's okay. Just if, if it's a, if it's a good test, accept the failure and say, all right, how quick can I change that score if it's a good prediction of something? Yeah, you, usually the only time I go to the doctor is preceded by yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I just do whatever she tells me. And I'm like, okay, let's get this thing done. And does she require you to bring a note back saying you went? Or can you just take off? No, a- <laughs> no, she is usually standing right outside the door with her arms crossed like, hmm? hmm? Yep. 
And then, and then goes and talks to, and then talks to the doctor. Like she's my mother. She's going to find out everything. Yeah. You know what I was thinking of when you brought up the patent thing? I just watched a, a documentary on Steve Jobs. Which one? Yes. It's, the, it's the one that has just, I, I think, uh, what was it on? The uh, Erickson. Uh, Actually, it was on Hulu, so it's a, a little bit of an older one, but it was, it was well done in that it's not trying to enshrine him mm -hmm. or like vilify him. One. No, no, no. It's, it's a documentary. It's got real footage. But it talks about Jobs was very much like Patton and that he got a lot of stuff done, but he had to bully a lot of it. You know, he had to push people beyond what they were ever willing to do, mm. you know, and, and it wasn't always great. I think, if anything, uh, Patton probably was a little bit more gentle with the people working for him than, than Jobs was. But, but if you look at, there's, a, there's a, a tenacity there that pushes people beyond. And, and that's, oh, yeah. what I, that's what came across, sort of like, if you look at a, a Patton documentary and a Jobs documentary, two completely different totally. things they're working with but they're almost taking the same approach. Well, the, the, that whole thing about, what, what's it? Walter Isaacson uh, wrote that big biography of him. And, and I, you know, it's a little bit, um, uh, whatever, you know, it sort of worships him a little bit, but it's, it's actually, but it, it contains a lot of stuff that I think is probably accurate and not, not exactly positive. But one of the things it talks about is about the, his uh, truth distortion field where he distorts the truth, you know, you, you know, wh whether, what wh did he know, you know, he would envision something and then he would start saying it, even though at that moment it was not true. Right. And he would, and you would be, you'd be working with him and you'd say, um, no, this does, this does not function the way you, you're saying it functions. And it is not, does not look as neat as you say it looks. And he would be like, yeah, he, he would not hear it. He would say, yes, it does. It does. And then they would go back at it and go, by the time he got finished with it, it did. It was true. He made it true. He spoke it into existence. Right. But he spent, <laughs> he would spend sometimes years lying about it and people working for him would just get churned up and chewed up by this insane guy. And, and it does sort of raise questions like uh, uh, that Theranos woman yeah. With the blood yeah, test. So, oh, great example. Yeah. yeah. Where, where you, 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 I mean, I, you know, obviously she's a crook and a liar and she's surrounded by crooks and liars and they were, you know, it, it, it was devastating what they, what they did. But I mean, if you just took a snapshot of Steve Jobs at some moment in time, is, was he any different than, it, it just never, with her, it just never became true. Well, in the great words of George Costanza, if you believe it, it's true. <laughs> if you believe it, it's not a lie. Yeah. And, 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 you know, so some people have to believe it before they see it, and some, most of us have to see it before yeah. we, we believe it. But, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've felt myself trying to do that sometimes, seeing things should be approached a different way and trying to speak it into existence. And Lee's going to call bullshit on it right until I get all my ducks in a row, and then we'll run a test on it. And if it's not right, then I can't have another good idea for six months. But if it is, he's like, what else you got? <laughs> yeah, definitely the bullshit meeting. He's my editor. <laughs> That'll do it for season one of the Movement Podcast. And from myself, Gray, Lee, and the team, thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please take a moment to rate, review, and tell your friends. We'll be back in a few weeks with season two, so be sure to subscribe and follow us on social media to know when the next episode drops. Until then, be sure to first move well, then move often.